can tell you not to sing your story? Who all can tell you that you're singing off key? You are the dancer, you are not the dancer. You are the song, not the one who sang. Be on you, beautiful song, songbird. No, you tell the truth. You tell the truth. From the Media Factory in the south end of Burlington, Vermont, this is 99.3 FM WBTV LP Burlington and streaming online at 99.3 WBTV.org. We are also live on TV on VCAM in Vermont and streaming on YouTube on the Morella DeVoe channel. This is Thrive with Morella. I'm Morella DeVoe. How would you cope with an HIV positive diagnosis or living with AIDS? Would you be able to find your way towards thriving despite the diagnosis? My guest today has documented hundreds of women's experiences living with HIV AIDS and how they go from dying from HIV AIDS to living with the diagnosis to thriving despite the diagnosis. And today we have a chance to learn from these women's stories and their experiences as well as my guest's experience. How do you thrive despite living an incurable disease is the question today. So my guest is Celeste Watkins Hayes. She's a professor of sociology and African-American studies. And she's a faculty fellow at the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University. She is also the author of The New Welfare Bureaucrats, Entanglements of Race, Class, and Policy Reform. Her new book, Remaking a Life, How Women Living with HIV AIDS Confront Inequality, is available now. Celeste Welcome to Thrive with Morella. Thank you so much, Morella. It's wonderful to be here with you. It's wonderful to have you. I'm really, uh, I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you because of the really important work that you're doing in connecting with these women, but also because I think there's a lot that we can probably learn from them. So as you know, my first question to all of my guests is, what is one of your personal keys to thriving in life? I think one of my personal keys to thriving in life is making sure that I surround myself with people who are supportive, people who don't necessarily always agree with every idea that I have, but who fundamentally support my desire to thrive and to be the best person that I can be. So whether it's family members, friends, colleagues, people in my professional circle, but also people that I see on a on an everyday basis who are friends or just acquaintances, I really try to draw in the people who are really going to give me energy and support and encouragement and sometimes tough love and challenging questions, always with a spirit of support. Mm. How important the uh, the people you surround yourself with, you know, Absolutely. do they do they help raise you or do they, you know, detract, put you down? Um, that's such an important one. And, you know, I think you might be the first person to say something like that. We got a lot of uh, nature, time in nature, quiet, you know, that sort of thing. But um community, that's that's so community. important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Celeste, the first thing that got me really curious about you and this work is how exactly you got into doing this work of documenting the lives of these women over so many years in Chicago and outside of Chicago of women living with HIV AIDS. How, what was the first thing that got you on this path? Yes, so when I was a graduate student, I was a research assistant on a study that was looking at the impact of welfare reform on low income women in the city of Boston. And I met a woman who I was interviewing over an 18 month period who happened to be also living with HIV. And I was intrigued that her support systems, her networks, her community was markedly different from the other women we were talking to. And part of it was because of her ties to the HIV community. So I thought that it was interesting, but it was an idea that I kind of filed away in the back of my head. Mm. 
In 2005, uh, when I was an assistant professor, I started to hear and read more and more about the growing number of women who were being diagnosed with HIV. And the person that I had interviewed all those years prior when I was a graduate student resonated with me and I began to interview women in Chicago who were also living with HIV and over time over the course of a decade I my team and I would come to interview over a hundred women living with HIV in the city of Chicago really with the goal of understanding their experiences learning how they think about the diagnosis and how they think about going about their lives despite the diagnosis, how they think about building families and relationships and, and taking care of their health and participating in their communities. Once one receives such a shocking diagnosis that um, at the time for many of the women is interpreted as a death sentence, how do people respond to that? And how do they nevertheless build lives for themselves? Right. So interesting. And so the the kind of follow up question for me is as you start to dive into that is, so how do they start coping? How do they start going from this kind of what feels like a death sentence into finding their way out of I'm dying into I'm living with this? And then ultimately, I mean, this is obviously, I would imagine it's a long journey, but how do they start finding their way out of this death sentence and, you know? Absolutely. So it's important to remember what HIV means and what an HIV diagnosis means. So first of all, yes, it is a medical condition. So people are grappling with the idea that they have an illness that could kill them. Um, we now have medications that make that less and less of a reality, and we can certainly talk about the amazing medical advances that have been made so that women can live pretty much normal life expectancies if they're on medication and have undetectable, and undetectable viral loads. But certainly when they're diagnosed, they don't necessarily know that and have that information. So many interpret it as a, a physical death sentence. But the other thing they interpret it as is a social death sentence. The idea mm -hmm. of how do you grapple with the stigma? Because many women believe that having HIV says something about them. They worry about the stigma. They worry if there's a perception that they are contaminated or promiscuous or have made bad choices throughout their lives. So many women in, immediately personalize it to worry about what is this stigma going to say about me and what is this gonna mean for me? And then the third thing that I'll say is we have to remember that HIV, although it can happen to anyone, anyone is, can be diagnosed with HIV, but it is absolutely driven by inequality. Mm. So that the people who are most vulnerable, the people who have the, less, the least access to resources, the people who are already marginalized on the basis of sexual orientation, race, class, gender identity, are also the people who are disproportionately bearing the burden of the HIV epidemic. So that means that when many women are diagnosed, they're dying from a whole host of challenges. There are also many of them are struggling with poverty and homelessness mm -hmm. and sexual trauma. Others have a trajectory in which things were going pretty smoothly until the trauma of HIV, and now they're worried about losing access to their health care should it be discovered that they're living with HIV. They're worried about being fired from their jobs and experiencing discrimination. So we've got to remember the ways in which inequality in terms of who gets access to resources, who's able to keep and protect their resources, is inextricably linked to the epidemic in ways that really create a lot of concern for women once they're diagnosed. Right. Well, it's huge. And, you know, as I'm hearing you speak, it's no surprise that, you know, marginalized groups of people, marginalized individuals would bear the brunt of uh, the HIV epidemic, because we also know, because it probably goes hand in hand with uh, sexual uh, sexual assault, sexual uh, abuse statistics also point to the fact that it is marginalized people, uh, homeless people, people living in poverty, uh, people, you know, uh, LGBT, the LGBT community as well, who have a um, far higher rate of um, of being victimized in, in sexual crimes. And so this probably goes hand in hand, I would imagine with. Absolutely, and part of it is also, so it's on the one hand, absolutely, 
um, survivors of sexual trauma um, are disproportionately affected by the HIV epidemic. And I definitely found that in my research, I was really struck and taken aback by the number of women who had experienced sexual trauma, particularly sex or childhood sexual trauma that really made it difficult for them to negotiate things like condom use, mm -hmm. made it difficult to um, talk about sex and relationships made it difficult for them to empower themselves and to feel as though they could take control of their sexual and intimate relationships, um, that they often felt powerless in those dynamics, that they often felt that the only solution of navigating these difficult issues was silence and just not talking about what they were challenged with. So yeah. you're talking about some really complex things that make it feel, I would imagine, for these women that the deck is st stacked against them. Not only are they already in a marginalized situation where they don't have access to uh, the support systems that they need, where they're, you know, probably leaving, living in poverty or homelessness or, you know, all of these factors, social, um, you know, inequality factors that you're talking about. And now they have the, you know, the terrible diagnosis and the social stigma. The, this is a death sentence health-wise, but also a social death sense. So they have all of these things, right? So how, what are the tools, resources, the strengths that these women end up needing to build or rely on to help, you know, kind of move forward in spite of all of these, what feel like potentially seeming insurmountable obstacles? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when I started writing my book, Morella, I thought that this would be the end of the story. As a sociologist, I document inequality and I trace the roots of inequality. So my initial thought in writing this book is that I'm going to trace all of the different struggles that women living with HIV are facing and to really talk about the economic and racial and gender inequality that's driving the HIV epidemic. I absolutely saw evidence of that and was able to document that as many scholars have. But I also saw something different. I also talked to women who described their participation in the HIV community as being critical for them. And it goes back to what that respondent told me in that first interview that I did back in Boston when I was a graduate student, where this individual was pointing to the community of people living with HIV and its importance in helping her move from dying from to living with. Mm -hmm. So the project then took a turn and I began talking to people who were part of what I call the HIV safety net, the group of activists, advocates, service providers, policymakers who have all contributed to building an infrastructure for people living with HIV, an infrastructure made up of people, places, and policies that support people living with HIV in critical ways. What do they do? What does this infrastructure provide? First of all, it provides women with access to health care. So through the Ryan White Care Act, which was a, a policy that was passed in the 1990s, some of your, your viewers may remember, Ryan White, the young hemophiliac that passed away of AIDS-related complications for which the policy is named. Women are able to get access to medication and health care, so that's one, health care is key. Number two, they were able to get access to some modest economic assistance. So whether it was getting access to the social security uh, system through disability benefits, or working with HIV AIDS service providers to get access to employment or working with people who would help them uh, maintain the employment that they already had, maintaining that economic support was the second thing that the HIV AIDS safety net was able to help many women do. The third thing that the HIV community does very effectively is provide very robust social support for people living with HIV. So when we look at the support group structure, when we look at the case management system where people get one-on-one -on -one support from a professional, when we look at the buddy systems, all of that emerged in the 1980s and the 1990s during HIV AIDS activism. So we often might think about the activists who were acting up on the Washington Mall and pushing for policies and really holding our government to account. While that was happening, there was also this infrastructure of social support being built 
difficult for people who are already living with HIV that lives to this day. And the first thing that the HIV safety net did is that it created an opportunity and it provided an on-ramp and still provides an on-ramp to political and civic engagement for people living with HIV so that people are not merely recipients of services. They are activists. They are active agents in their own health and in their own lives and in turn really hold it a priority to help others who are also grappling with the disease or who might find themselves at higher their risk. So those four things taken together, the access to health care, the modest economic assistance, the robust social support, and the, the education, the on-ramp around how do you get politically engaged? How do you speak truth to power? How do you use your story to, to help others and to talk about policies that need to change is the special sauce that the HIV AIDS community built that became instrumental for the women that I talked to. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I, I'm just recapping. You're mentioning the medical support, the modest economic support, the social network, and then the education to help them kind of like get involved and get get politically involved um, and own their story. So I was going to ask you about you know what what are some of the keys. It, that help these women thrive despite this diagnosis. So you're mentioning these four things. Um, would you say, I'm curious as to the element about becoming um, active, becoming either politically involved or owning their story, how much of a factor do you feel that is in that element of thriving? Right. I think it's really important in a couple of different ways. And first of all, the first way that I think it's in, it's helpful is that it helps women take their story from marginalization to meaning. So mm -hmm. whether one is in a support group telling her story or whether one is standing on a stage in front of thousands telling her story, it's really important for women to be able to take that experience of marginalization and to talk about the meaning behind it, the significance, and how that can be used to educate other people about what policies need to change, what injustices exist in the world, what women themselves learned along this journey. Storytelling is key in the HIV AIDS movement. And through that storytelling, women can use that for political advocacy work. So sometimes it's very quiet work. Sometimes it's just mentoring another woman who's in a support group meeting mm. where real what's political is that these women are fighting to survive. And that in and of itself is a political act in the sense that when you're talking about marginalized people and their ability to survive, just being able to make it is a political act because there are many who don't care or who would quickly write them off. Mm. So it can be a small politics, but it can also be a much more significant politics. When we look up at the history of HIV AIDS activism, Women have always been there. They've been really critical players. They haven't always been as visible and as vocal. We often think about this as a movement driven by gay men, and they were absolutely some of the first and most important organizers. But women were part of it, too, whether it was through their own involvement in the LGBTQ struggle, which incorporated HIV AIDS activism, or there were women who were nurses and physicians and other providers who took this charge up and became politically active, or when it was women themselves who were living with HIV who challenged the government, challenged public opinion, and challenged politicians to change in important ways. Right. And I love what you said, g moving from marginalized, from being marginalized to meaning or mar from marginalization to meaning. And Absolutely. it's, yeah, it's that piece uh, that we can all take away is looking at how the stories of victimization in our life, the experiences of victimization in our life where we've been either marginalized or victimized, we can take them and see what is the meaning that I can extract from this. What I I was I had actually made a note to to talk about this and say, do you feel that this is about reclaiming their power back from the disease, back from the abuse or the marginalization that they felt? Is that what you feel this is about? Is it about taking their power back or is it something else in your view? I think it's about taking their power back in many ways. And it's also about taking their power back for them, but also for their communities. Because what was so striking 
was the way in which women said to themselves internally, I will not be counted out. I will not be discounted. And I will not be told that my experiences don't matter because of who I am and because of what I look like and what I've experienced and what my diagnosis may be. So part of what we saw very, very powerfully when we talked to women was their willingness to take their power back, not just for themselves and for their own healing, but to use that to then influence other people and to influence the conversation and to shape policy and to try to improve people, improve things for people who were coming behind them. Right. And it's such a powerful thing. You know, you keep coming back to community, to using your experience to support others, to teach others, to even mentor, even if it's just one person. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be activism at, you know, the large scale, but it can be one thing. You know, I think the the core thing that we can all take away is that we can, every single one of us can take our experiences of pain and see how can I turn this into service and that looking to turn it into service can be a powerful way for us to reclaim that power, to move into thriving despite the pain, despite, you know, a disease that, or diagnosis that is never gonna go away, um, but that we can find our way back to living a life that feels that we're, we're being a contribution, where there, there's still so much, yeah, like you're saying, I won't be silenced, I you know, I won't be shut down, I won't be discarded, I, there's so much that I can still do. So I, I love that you're sharing that. So do you have a favorite story or a couple favorite anecdotes of, you know, life changes or turnarounds or, you know, is there someone that one of the women or a couple of the women that stand out Absolutely. for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what this story is also going to highlight that I'm going to tell you is the importance of the infrastructure that has to be there to support women in that fight. So it's not enough for us to just decide that we're going to change our lives. There's also, I think my book shows, got to be an infrastructure to support it. And particularly for marginalized women, they're still facing some very, very concrete barriers that have to get addressed. They're still trying to get their basic needs met. And that's where I think the policy story comes in, in terms of what's around women to support them. So I'll, I'll tell you a story that, il that illustrates that. So when we were in the early stages of the epidemic, scientists were trying to determine how do we know when an HIV diagnosis has become what we might call full-blown AIDS. When has the disease evolved to the point that the person has what we now diagnose as stage four HIV or what's commonly known as AIDS? How do we know that? And the reason why that's important is because it's important for us to count scientifically how many people have an AIDS diagnosis. It's important as we try to think about medicines and treatment, but it's also important in terms of access to resources and benefits because some of the resources and benefits for people living with HIV only are out the person has a full-blown AIDS diagnosis because the resources unfortunately are limited. Mm. So in the late 1980s, there was a woman named Katrina Haslett who was an inmate in the Bedford Hills Prison for Women in New York State. And at the time, about 20% of the women coming into Bedford Hills incarcerated were also living with HIV. Oh, wow. The epidemic was early stages. There wasn't much, there wasn't medication available that was effective. And scientists were really trying to just get a handle on what it was that these, this epidemic was. But nevertheless, Katrina studied everything that she could about what it meant to be HIV positive, everything that she could about the diagnosis because her work assignment in Bedford Hills was in the prison library. So she read everything that she could. And when other women came into the library and disclosed that they had an HIV status as well, Katrina shared her information. They started a women's organization for women living with HIV in Bedford Hills. And around the same time, there was an attorney in the New York City named who was working for legal aid and was seeing a very interesting thing. Many women were coming in with all kinds of health challenges, almost a death store, but they were not qualifying for the benefits given to people with AIDS. 
their physicians would see them, but at the end of the day, with a whole host of illnesses, their medical records would be stamped, doesn't have AIDS, which meant that they also didn't get access to resources. And many women died penniless, losing custody of their children because they couldn't take care of them because they weren't getting any assistance to help with their medical diagnosis. So Terry McGovern figured out that the science around how we determine what constitutes an AIDS diagnosis was based on research that was done on men. So many of the things we were missing in terms of an HIV diagnosis and its transformation to AIDS in women, such as cervical cancer, which was somewhat common among women who um, had AIDS diagnosis weren't being caught and understood by physicians. So Terry McGovern sues the federal government to change the case definition and to say that the federal government is allocating resources to people with AIDS on a gender discriminatory basis. But she needs a spokesperson. Wow. She needs a living with HIV who's willing to go out there and tell her story. Katrina Haslip gets released from prison. She connects with Terry McGovern and Katrina Haslip becomes one of the most vocal and effective activists for women living with AIDS in the country. Mm. They end up very successfully along with the women of ACT UP Women's Caucus suing the federal government and having the definition of an AIDS diagnosis expanded to include symptoms commonly found in women and to use T-cell counts, which are a marker of, um, and CD4 cell counts, which are markers of HIV in the body to measure HIV status, which wow. is not a gendered marker. So it really goes to show how without Katrina's voice and that discussion, without this highly stigmatized and marginalized woman helping others and willing to put herself on the line and tell her story and to push this case forward and to put a name with a face, we would not have had that really important advance in how we understand this epidemic, but also in how we support people who are grappling with it. Wow. And to change, to have that level of impact and changing how for women AIDS is measured or defined uh, is so extraordinary it's um yeah it's the sort of thing that you know when you when you think about you know little old me you know what can i do and in particular in katrina's case you know she's incarcerated she's living with aids you know that sort of thing and th to see what is possible when somebody owns their story so before we have to say goodbye to our TV audience, if you're just joining us on TV or on the radio or YouTube, my guest today is Celeste Watkins Hayes. She is a professor at Northwestern University and a faculty fellow at the Institute for Poly Policy Research at Northwestern University. And uh, her new book is called Remaking a Life, How Women Living with HIV AIDS Confront Inequality. That book is available now and you can also find the link to it on the Thrive with Morella podcast page, which is thrivewithmorella.com forward slash podcast. So we'll we'll say goodbye to our, our TV viewers. We're going to lose you in a few in in just about a minute or so, but you can continue to listen to my conversation with Celeste for the next few minutes on 99.3 FM in Burlington or watch on YouTube on the Morella DeVoe channel. So Celeste taking, you know, going from marginalization to meaning to becoming an activist in the small scale or the big scale as Katrina did to reclaiming our power back from our pain. So, you know, by either looking to be of service or just, you know, simply choosing to tell our story. What else is important do you feel to share as to what else we can learn from these women as to how to thrive in life despite big challenges? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that I grapple with is the irony of my book. The fact that it had to take an, an AIDS diagnosis or an HIV diagnosis for women to get access to the services and the support that they needed all along. So part of the takeaway that I also want people to think about is how